Welcome to Life in Biology. I'm Dr. Joel Graff. Today we're going to talk about microRNAs and how they can control gene expression regulation. So microRNAs are fine tuners of gene expression. Okay. So if you've been watching my channel for a while, you'll know that DNA gets transcribed to be mRNA and mRNA can be translated to be protein. And that process can give you lots of different kinds of proteins, depending on what genes are. Uh, here, I'm highlighting a few proteins that will come into play later in this video, and that would be Argonaut 1, 2, 3, and 4. Uh, humans encode four different Argonaut proteins, and Argonaut's kind of a long word, so we just shorten it to AGO, or A-G-O. All right. The DNA not only can be transcribed and uh, made into mRNA, but you can have transcription that can end up giving you a microRNA. Now there are some processing steps here uh, that I will talk through in the next uh, slide, but these microRNAs then have two potential jobs they can do. One, they can go up and cause a increased rate of degradation of the mRNA that it happens to target, whatever, and there's a whole set of genes that each microRNA probably targets. Another method is that in conjunction with these Argonaut proteins, they can also cause uh, translation inhibition. So we'll talk through processing of microRNAs first, and then we'll move on to how those uh, how those functions are carried out as far as degradation of the RNA, mRNA, and the inhibition of translation. Okay, so here we have microRNA biogenesis. So biogenesis is just our fancy scientific way of saying microRNA processing. Uh, in the nucleus, pre primary microRNAs, primary miRNA is the shorthand version of primary microRNA. They are transcribed almost always by polymerase 2, sometimes polymerase 3, but polymerase 2 is typically the one that gives you a regular old mRNA. So these are oftentimes if will uh, look similar to a regular mRNA in that they have a cap on their 5' prime end and a poly A tail on their 3' prime end. However, because RNA is single-stranded, there is the possibility that RNAs can fold up into secondary and tertiary structures, so three-dimensional structures. Uh, and here is an example of uh, an, an RNA that is folding, and you have uh, a loop out at the end. This is a stem, and there's a bulge in the middle of this stem. Uh, and then there is a protein called drosha or drosha. I think it's drosha. And it is a nuclease that causes a double-stranded RNA break. And I've indicated here that the break occurs right above the main bulge. Now, there might be some nucleotide mismatches in here, but there's a big bulge down here and then the loop here. So it cuts between those two areas. Then that that leaves us with a stem with a loop on the top so that stem loop structure ends up going out into the cytoplasm uh, through a nuclear pore there's another nuclease uh, drasha was the one that worked in the nucleus that worked on this really big rna and when we're left with a pre microRNA, um, then we have the second nuclease called dicer cause a double-stranded RNA break, and I've indicated with arrows approximately where on that stem loop structure, the primary or pre-microRNA, pre where that would happen. So if you cut off that loop at the end, now you're just left with double-stranded RNA. This is where the Argonaut proteins come into play. One thing I haven't drawn on this is a helicase that uh, acts with the Argonaut and it separates out the two strands. So just like when we were copying DNA and you had double-stranded DNA and you wanted to separate them, uh, the, the two strands from each other, we made use of a helicase. Again, a helicase gets used 
And with these argonaut proteins, one of the strands of the microRNA gets loaded into the argonaut protein, while the other strand does not. The, the one that gets loaded into the argonaut protein is called uh, the guide strand of the microRNA. And the strand that doesn't get loaded, it's a, called a passenger strand, or sometimes it's called a star strand. And what happens to that is that it ends up just getting degraded. So these, uh, the guide RNAs that are held within the argonaut protein are long-lived protein or long-lived RNA molecules, and these are short-lived. So you build up a bunch of these argonaut microRNA uh, complexes. It's a ribonucleoprotein complex because it has both ribonucleotide RNA and a protein. And then that guide RNA will do the Watson-Crick base pairing. That's A's and T's, or A's and U's matchup, and G's and C's. We can't say A and T because we're talking RNA at this point. And here is a, an mRNA that is out in the cytoplasm that happens to in, interact with and be uh, bound by that argonaut protein because the guide RNA matched with it, okay? So what next? Well, when the RNA is bound by the argonaut protein, and just a quick walk through this RNA, we've got a cap at the five prime end. That's what that little circle is. We've got a five prime untranslated region. This box here indicates where the protein coding information is. We have a long stretch of un, un, untranslated region at the three prime end, and that is typically where the microRNAs will bind to on an mRNA. And then we've got the poly A tail. So that's the five prime end to three prime end, and the microRNAs typically bind three prime untranslated region. Okay, we're bound here. So then we have to either lead to degradation of the RNA or inhib uh, inhibition of the translation. So let's look at, uh, we have three different mechanisms here, but all these different means end up with the same outcome. And although it looks like I've drawn three different outcomes here, the thing you wanna keep in mind is that the action of this microRNA will help reduce uh, the likelihood that a protein is going to be made. So these are fine tuners, they knock down the protein expression level by some uh, moderate amount. Number one here, I've drawn uh, the micro or the mRNA and then I've got it broken right here. There's a gap in the sequence and the uh, microRNA and the argonaut protein are floating off. This happens only if it's argonaut 2. Argonaut 2 has a nuclease domain in it and kind of like the CRISPR proteins, Cas9 proteins, this one is able to cause a cut in whatever the guide RNA targets it to. Okay, so only argonaut 2 uh, causes this. And sometimes argonaut 2, the slang name for argonaut 2 is slicer. So if you ever run across slicer in, the, in the, your research on microRNAs, that's what they're talking about. The second thing that can happen to this micro or this mRNA that is bound by an argonaut protein in a microRNA is that they can end up in these uh, structures within the cell called P bodies. When you learn about a cell, you typically learn about uh, all the different organelles in the cell and uh, things like the nucleus, endoplasmic reticulum, mitochondria, on and on. There's also a ton of uh, organelles in the cell that do not have an envelope on them. Uh, and processing bodies or P-bodies are an example of this. But it's an, a place in the cytoplasm where certain proteins and RNAs and other molecules can accumulate. So within this processing body, we've got the RNA, mRNA, bound by the, uh, the microRNA with the argonaut protein. One thing that can happen within the processing body is that there, I've drawn a little Pac-Man shaped protein here and that is a nuclease this is a three prime to five prime nuclease meaning that it works first works on uh, chomping off the poly a tail 
and then it works its way down the three prime UTR and causes degradation. So we've got degradation of mRNA here, which was a endonuclease degradation. Endo means within, so the cut is caused within. And then this is called exonuclease because it starts at an end. And if we have a three prime to five prime uh, exonuclease, there is also the possibility of if the cell having, and there is in cells, they have a five prime to three prime uh, exonuclease that would work from the five prime end, but that's not what you typically see within the processing body. So we've got two different versions of degradation, one that can happen due to Argonauts nuclease activity, another that can happen, this is a CCR4, or, or C, yeah, CCR4 or not, anyway, three prime to five prime nucleus. The other thing that can happen in the pea body is that you might not get the endonuclease or exonuclease attacking the mRNA, and you might just have the mRNA basically being stored there uh, in the processing body. And these processing bodies can build up or go away depending on the situation that the cell is in. So M mRNAs that are within the processing body, if the processing body dissolves for whatever reason, this mRNA could make it back out into the cell and be translated where the ribosomes are, or out in the cytoplasm where the ribosomes are. You wouldn't have any ribosomes in your processing body, okay? So that's a third thing that can happen. You can have stalled uh, or storage of mRNAs and so that you don't get translation. So either way you look at it, whether it's the degradation two types of degradation or the stalling of the translation, you're gonna be preventing uh, protein from being made as much as it would had you not had any microRNAs around. Okay, well that was a pretty detailed video, uh, a, lot, a lot in there, so I hope you enjoyed, hope you learned something. Talk to you later, like and subscribe or not.